نستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يؤمن بالله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار in the oh praise and thanks are due to allah we praise him we seek his assistance and we seek his forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our actions. Whosoever Allah guides, then there is none that can lead him astray, and whosoever Allah leads astray, then there is none that can guide him. And I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah. He is alone having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his slave and final messenger. What do you believe? We fear Allah as he should be feared. I do not die except in a state of Islam with complete submission to Allah. O mankind, be dutiful to your Lord who created you from a single person. And from him he created his wife, and from them both he created many men and women. And fear Allah from whom we demand your mutual rights. And do not cut the relations of the wounds. Surely Allah is ever and all watcher over you. O you who believe, keep your duty to Allah and fear him and always speak the truth. He will direct you to do righteous good deeds and will forgive you your sins. And whosoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he has indeed achieved a great achievement. To proceed, indeed the best speech is the Book of Allah, the Quran. And the best speech is the, guide, uh, the, the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Sunnah. And the worst of affairs are the newly invented matters in the religion. And every newly invented matter in the religion is an innovation, a bid'ah. And every bid'ah is misguidance, and every misguidance is in the hellfire. My brothers and sisters, I'm very happy and pleased to be here with you brothers in the city of Nottingham, in this masjid, Masjid Umar, which is uh, the masjid of the people of Hadith, the people who follow the Salaf. It's given me great pleasure to be with our brothers, uh, with whom we share one methodology, one way, the way of the Quran and the Sunnah, and the way which follows the methodology of the Sahaba, Allah be pleased with them all, and the rightly guided predecessors that have passed before us. I came to this masjid, I think, in 2008. Was that about when we opened, I think? And that was the last time I came here. I think it was New York, and we went to the top floor. And I brought Sheikh Wasilullah, a bus from Makkah, my sheikh, and we, the sheikh did a talk, and uh, well, it was nice to see, mashallah, this must be open. It's very nice to see now that from that day, things have moved on a lot, and we've got such a beautiful place here, mashallah. May Allah bless it, may Allah bless it, and reward all the brothers, and may Allah reward for that Hussein who invited me. So today, the topic is about the trials of the grave. And this is a lecture within a series of lectures talking about the issues of the unseen. Now, I'm not usually a lecturer, to be honest. I very rarely deliver lectures. I tend to do some lessons in my local mosque and put Um But this is an interesting, and this is a very important topic. And this is a topic which the benefits of this topic stretch further than what you might think. The benefits of this topic stretch throughout every aspect of a Muslim life and they stretch throughout the, effect, the aspects of the dunya and the akhirah of the believer. So this issue is an issue uh, of the unseen. So this is something 
which requires belief. And the issue that we are talking about, the issue of the trials of the grave, comes under the heading of al barzakh that this is a special kind of existence and a special life. The life that we have, man's life, broadly can divide it into three sections. So the first section we can say is the life of this world. So the life that we are living now is the first stage. And this life starts from our birth and ends with our death. Okay? Then another stage begins in our existence, in the existence and the journey of man, which is the existence and the life of Al-Barzah. And this starts at your death. And it carries on up until the Day of Judgment. So that period between your death and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishing the hour and establishing the Day of Judgment, all of that period is what we are talking about today, Barzah. Okay? And then the third stage is the life of the Akhirah, the life of the Hereafter, which is from the minute the people are going to be raised a second time from their graves, when the hour is established and the Day of Judgment is established, and then this will be spent and will be, finished, will be sort of going on for eternity in either paradise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for paradise, or it will be spent in hellfire when we seek Allah's refuge from being of the people of the hellfire. So the life of Barzah, it is the life that lasts from when you die up until the time you are resurrected and raised up again. So this applies whether you are actually buried in a grave or whether you die and your body, for example, is burnt and doesn't exist anymore because it's just ashes, or whether you are eaten by wild animals or whether you are you know, lost at sea. All of this still comes under the life of the grave. When we're talking about the life of the grave, we don't only need just the grave itself. So this life in Barzakh, it will be either filled with goodness and happiness and delight, or it will be a very hellish existence. And the grave will either be one of the gardens of paradise, or it will be one of the ditches of hellfire. So this is something that we believe in. This is something that we can't see. Sometimes people ask, they say, we dug up a grave for some reason. We didn't see any punishment going on to the person dead in the grave. If it was something that we could see, and it was something that we could see with our five senses, we could sense physically, we would have hissy proof, physical proof about it, and it would, not, no, it would no longer be an issue of Iman. It would no longer be an issue of Ghaib. So this is something that Allah SWT wants us to believe, and this is something that we cannot know by our five senses. So this is an important point. So this is a doubt that people raise to the scholars all the time, that is what happens if you've been eaten by a shark, what happens if you, we open the grave or somebody's been, instead of being put in a grave, they've been embalmed and they've been put into different things like Lenin, for example, is still in a standard glass box in Moscow, I think, or St. Petersburg, or wherever he is. People are looking at that body day and night and you can't see any azab going on to that body. So people ask these doubts, people have these doubts. So Shaykh Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah, one of the big Imams of the recent past, when they asked him about this, he likened it to your state of sleep. And as we know, that sleep is the brother of death. So just like when you're asleep, you can go through amazing experiences. You can go through some dreams that you never want to wake up from. You wake up in the morning from the dream and you think, ah, oh, I wish that was real. Or carry on want to dream that dream. Or you can also have a dream which is completely horrific. You, you have a dream that when you wake up from the dream, you thank Allah that you woke up and that was only a dream. And you have a move from your bed. Somebody saw you from outside, they wouldn't see what's happening with you. You could be wandering around in the garden of paradise in your dream, or you could be in a ditch in hellfire in your dream and nobody would see. But this for you is real. And for you, at that point, your happiness your pleasure or your extreme terror and your fear is real. And only when you come out of that do you actually realize that that was just a dream. So just like that, then death is the, the, the sleep is the brother of death. Then likewise with death, we don't see what's happening to the soul. So a person might look like he is just sleeping, resting, but he's dead. But in reality, that person is being punished. Likewise, a person may look 
uncomfortably yet, but that person may be enjoying the bliss of the next life. So this is something to do with our Iman. And this is something that the people who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and who follow the Salaf of this Ummah, we believe because our belief is based upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the punishment of the grave, the punishment of Gaza in the Quran. So he said in uh, the story of Fir'aun, وَحَاقَ بِعَالِ فِرْعَوْنَ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ أَنْ نَالُ يُعْرَضُونَ عَلَيْهَا غُدُوبٌ وَعَشِيَّةٌ وَيَوْمَ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ أَدْخِلُوا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ أَشَدَّ الْعَذَابِ An evil torment has encompassed the people of Fir'aun. The fire, they are exposed to it morning and evening. And the day the hour appears, it will be said, make the people of Pharaoh enter the severest punishment. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a current situation of the people of Fir'aun. So the people of Fir'aun are people who have passed away before us. The hour has not yet been established. So these people are being punished and they are being exposed to the fire of hell every morning and every evening. So this is the punishment of the grave. So this is established from the Quran. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu one of the great Sahaba, one of the great scholars of the Sahaba, he said that the souls of the people of Pharaoh and those who are like them among the Kuffar, they are shown the fire every morning and every evening and they are told, this is your hope. Ibn Kathir, rahimullah, he said, this ayah is the main basis of the Sunni's belief in the torment of Al-Barzakh in the grave. And Imam Al-Qurtubi, the Mufassir, he said, that some of the scholars quoted as evidence to prove the torment of the grave, this ayah, Surah Ghafir, Surah number 40, ayah number 46. And he said a similar view was also expressed by Mujahid, Ikrimah, Muqatil, and Muhammad bin Ka'ab, all of whom said that this ayah is proof of the torment of the grave. And he said, do you not see that it says concerning the torment of the hereafter, and on the day when the hour will be established, it will be said, caused Firaun's people to enter the severest torment, uh, torment. So this is talking about punishment which is going on before the establishment of the hour. Before these people enter into hell, hell is being shown to them every morning and every evening. Also, we follow the sunnah, we follow the authentic sunnah of our Prophet We believe in the words of our Prophet Everything that he has told us, it is part of our duty to believe in it and to accept it, to follow it, to practice it, to hold to it. And from the authentic evidences, there are many hadith which we'll, we will go through today, which talk about the punishment of the grave. And from them is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhu, who said that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "When one of you dies, he is shown his place." in the morning and the evening. If he is one of the people of paradise, then he's shown paradise. And if he's one of the people of hell, then he is shown hell. Narrated by Bukhari. Also narrated by Musaqil Bukhari and Sahih Muslim from Aisha radiallahu anha. That a Jewish woman visited her and she mentioned to her the torment of the grave, mentioned to her the punishment of the grave and said to her, may Allah protect you from the torment of the grave. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam about the punishment of the grave and he said yes, the punishment or the torment of the grave. So then Aisha radiallahu anha says that she looked and she never saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam pray any prayer after that but he sought refuge with Allah from the torment of the grave. So this is in Bukhari Muslim. And likewise one of the du'as that we do in our prayer at the final tashakud is to ask Allah to grant us security from four things and one of those four things is from the Adab al-Qabr, the punishment of the grave. So in summary, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he said that it should be noted that the view of the early generations, the Salaf and the Imams of this Ummah is that when a person dies he will be in a state of bliss or torment and that that will happen to both his soul and to his body. After the soul departs from the body it will remain in a state of bliss or torment and it may connect to the body sometimes. So the body will experience the bliss or torment along with it at those times. 
Then on the day of resurrection, the souls will be restored to their bodies and will be raised up from their graves to meet the Lord of the world. All of this is unanimously agreed upon amongst the scholars of Hadith and Sunnah. So this is something that is the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is the, uh, established from the belief of the Salaf. This is established from the belief of all the Imams. And only very few people in this Ummah have ever come and denied this reality. And there used to be a group in this country, I remember about late 1990s, there used to be a group that used to argue a lot about this. But I think even they've given up arguing now because the proofs are so, you know, so massively stacked against them that they don't have any more argument to commit and I don't think they even mention this issue anymore. So, the first thing that starts the discussion about what happens in the grave is death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Iman that Kulu nafsin that every, every soul will taste death. Every one of us is going to die and we don't know when that death is. What really struck me a few weeks ago, there was a Muslim girl at university in, in London, I think. And she was studying for some exams and her, her friends were in the library and they were studying for their exams or getting ready for some, some uh, assignment or something and she was going to join them and she lived literally across the road from this library so she texted them saying I'm going to be with you in five minutes and she came out of her flat she crossed the road and got run over and died on that spot and she was what, 21 I think so, none of us know, my brothers and sisters, when this death is going to come. You can be sending a message on your text saying to someone, I'm on the way to you right now. I'm, I'm going to be there in two minutes, I'm going to be there in five minutes like this sister. And death can come to you without any warning and without any announcement. It can just come and then you will enter into this next life of al -Bazza. So this is something that we need to be aware of. And this is something that we need to spend our time thinking about. And this is something that we need to um, bear in mind the importance of. Because this issue of barzakh, as we will see, if the life in the barzakh is good, then the life after that, which is everlasting, will be better. And if in the life in the barzakh is bad and evil, then the life that will come after it will be more evil and more bad for the person. So this is the first stage that the, the, the person faces. So, what happens at death? Again, this is, um, this is one of the matters of the unseen. I'm a medical doctor by training, and as, med as medical doctors, we don't really know what happens at death. This is a, a mystery, which is a mystery to science as well. Recently, some studies have, have been done where they've been talking to people who've had near-death experiences and things like this. And now there are some of the scientists are actually saying that there is a life after death based on some of the observations that they've done. But this is something that is a mystery. This is something from the unseen. So this is something where we have to turn to Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for the news of what happens when we die. So there are many hadith where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us what happens when we die, what happens when we pass away. And we will look at some of these hadith now and we will divide them up because some of the hadith are very long. We will divide them into different sections. So we'll look, we're going to look at the issue of the barzakh in stages. So the first stage to look at is the actual death and the journey of your soul immediately after you die. What happens to your soul immediately after death? So what happens to the believer firstly? Let's, uh, the hadith, the Prophet uh, which we have mentioned from the Prophet mentions firstly the issue of the believer. So we are going to mention the issue of the believer first. So the first hadith is um, from the great Sahabi Al-Bar'a bin Azim radiallahu an, and it is narrated by Imam Ahmad um, in his Muslim but also Abu Dawood. And this hadith was cast as Sahih by Shaykh al -Bari. In fact, all the hadith I'm using today I've checked the uh, rating of these hadith by the Imams of Hadith and all of them are Hassan of Sahih, which are the two grades which are authentic and acceptable for us to accept as evidence. So this hadith, it says from Al-Bar'a bin Azim radiallahu anh, that we went out with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the funeral, 
for the janaza of a man from the um, from among the Ansar, the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we came to the grave, to the grave. And when the deceased was placed in the lahad, in the niche, there's two types of grave in the Sunnah or the Islam. One is uh, what they call shaq, which is just that you dig straight down, as you do see in this country often. You dig straight down, and the person is buried directly at the bottom of a hole that's dug. Some kind of uh, thing is put in place to stop the soil going on the body, and then it's filled in. The other way is for a lahad, which is that you dig down and then you dig sideways. And then you put the body in this niche sideways, and then you fill in the gap that you dug before. So this is how our Prophet was buried. He was buried in a niche like that. So you dig down and then to the side, and you face the person towards the Qibla, and then you fill in the area behind it. But due to differences in the soil, due to differences in the temperature of lands, etc., etc., sometimes the trench is used instead. So this uh, this Ansari, this companion of the Messenger of Allah, Allah from the Ansar, from the people of Medina, he was placed in the Lahad as was part of the Sunnah. And Bara bin Azib said that after this, the Messenger of Allah, Allah وسلم, sat down. And he said that we sat around him. And he describes how they sat around him. He said, Ka'anna ala that it was as if there were birds on our heads. If you can imagine a bird sitting on your head, if you want to keep the bird on your head, you have to keep completely still. You have to stay attentive and very, very still to keep the bird there. So this is how the Sahaba, used to sit with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That they would be so attentive, that they would be so still, focusing on the actions and the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that they would be as if there were birds on their heads. So he said in his hand, sallallahu alayhi wa he had a stick. And with the stick, he was scratching the ground. Then he raised his head and he said, seek refuge with Allah from the torment of the grave. And he said this two or three times. Then he said, when the believing slave is about to depart from this world and enter the hereafter, there come down to him from heaven angels with white faces like the sun and they sit around him as far as the eye can see they bring with them shrouds from the shrouds of paradise and perfumes from the perfumes of paradise then the angel of death comes and he sits by the person's head and he says oh you good soul Come out, come forth to forgiveness from Allah and to His pleasure. And then he said, Then the soul comes out easily. Just like a drop of water comes out easily from the mouth of a water skin. So you imagine how easy we pour the water out. That's how easily the soul of the believer comes out. When the soul comes out, the Prophet went on to say, then he seizes it. The angel of death seizes the soul. And they do not leave it in his hand for an instant before they take it from him, meaning these other angels who have come from heaven with the bright faces like the sun. And they put it into the shroud that they brought from the shrouds of Jannah. And they give it the perfume that they brought from the perfume of Jannah. And from that soul, from that soul with this shroud on it, comes a fragrance which is like the finest musk on the face of the earth. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, then they ascend. And while they ascend, they do not pass by any group of angels, but the angels say, Ma ala Who is this good soul? Who is this good soul? And the angels carrying this soul up, they say, that this is the son, this is so and so, the son of so and so, and they call him by the best names that he used to be known by in the world, until they reach the lowest heaven. Then they ask for it to be opened to them, and it is open, and the soul is welcomed, and it is accompanied to the next heaven by those who are closest to Allah up until they reach the seventh heaven. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
وَعِيدُ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ فَإِنَّ مِنْهَا خَلَقْتُهُمْ وَفِيهَا أُعِيدُهُمْ وَمِنْهَا أُخْرِجُهُمْ تَارَةً أُخْرَى Record the book of my slave in the Hiliyun, in the seventh heaven, and then return him to the earth, for from it I created them. To it I will return them, and from it I will bring them forth once again. So his soul is then returned down to the earth to his body. So then the Hadith goes on to uh, tell us more details which we'll come back to. So this is the journey of the soul of the believer immediately after his death. Then to the opposite of this, in the same Hadith, the Prophet ﷺ told us what happens to the soul of the disbeliever on his death. So again the Hadith is the same from Barah bin Azib that the Prophet ﷺ said about that, that when, but when the disbelieving soul is about to depart from this world and enter the hereafter, there come down to him from heaven angels with dark faces, bringing with them sackcloth. And they sit around him as far as the eye can see. Then the angel of death comes and sits by his head and he says, O evil soul, come out, for, come forth to the wrath of Allah and to his anger. Then the soul disperses and hides inside the body. And then it comes out, cutting the veins and the nerves on the way out, as if you were to pass a metal skewer through wet wool, tearing its way out. Then the Prophet said, when he, the angel of death, seizes the soul, those other angels, the ones who have got dark faces and have brought sackcloth and they bring with them an evil stench and an evil foul smell and they sit all around and that's all you can see. These angels, they do not leave the soul with the angel of death except as the Prophet some said, for an instant before they take it and they put it into that sackcloth that they brought and there comes from it a stench like the foulest stench of a dead body on the face of the earth. Then they start ascending. And they do not pass by any group of angels, but the angels ask them, Maha the Rukul Khabib, who is this evil soul? And they reply, Fulan ibn Fulan, bi akubahi asma ilati kana yusama biha fid dunya. It is so and so the son of so and so, and they will call him by the worst names that he was known by in this world. Until they reach the lowest heaven. Then they will ask for the lowest heaven to be open and it will not be open for him or her. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the ayah لَا تُفَتَّقُوا لَهُمْ أَبْوَابُ السَّمَاءِ وَلَا يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى يَلِجَ الْجَمَلُ فِي سَمِّ الْخِيَابِ For them the gates of heaven will not be open and they will not enter paradise until the camel goes through the eye of the needle. He, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that record the book of him in the Sijin, in the lowest earth, and then return him to the earth. For from it I created them, to it I will return them, and from it I will bring them forth once again. So then his soul will be thrown down. So that soul will be brought down. This soul will be thrown down from heaven to earth. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited the ayah, wa may yushrik billah. فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْتَفَهُ الطَّيْرُ أَوْ تَحْوِي بِهِمْ رِيْكُمْ فِي مَكَانٍ سَعِيْتٍ And whoever assigns partners to Allah, it is as if it is as if he had fallen from the sky and the birds had snatched him on the way down or the wind had thrown him to a far off place. So then, both of these souls have now been returned to the graves. Both the good soul who was admitted into paradise, traveled all the way up to the seventh heaven, and his name was recorded in the Ibn in the seventh heaven, and then he is brought down with honor and respect to his grave. And likewise, the evil soul who is taken up to the heavens and is not allowed entry, and his name is recorded in the Sijin amongst the evil people, and then he is thrown down, cast down, all the way, falling to the dunya, into his grave. So then starts the trials of the grave. This is the time which is the biggest trial. And in some of the hadith it describes this trial as being as great as the trial of the Jal. 
So this is a huge and immense trial which we are going to face in the grave. So in Sahih al-Bukhari, Anas radiallahu anh has a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that when a person is placed in his grave and his companions leave him and he can no longer hear the sound of their sandals, meaning the sound of their footsteps, two angels come to him and they make him sit up and they ask him, مَا كُنْتَ تَقُولُ فِي هَذَا رَجُلِ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Now what did you say about this man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Then that person, was, the believer will say, أَشْحَدُ أَنَّهُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ That I bear witness that he is the slave of Allah and his messenger. In a hadith of Abu Barah bin Azim, which is the same hadith we mentioned part of before, it carries on to tell us about the believer that his soul is returned to his body. And they come to him two angels who make him sit. And then they say to him, Man Rabbuk. So, Fayaqulu Rabbi Allah. They say to him, Who is your Lord? And he replies, My Lord is Allah. Then they say, Ma Dinuk. Fayaqulu Dini al Islam. They say, What is your religion? He says, My religion is Islam. Then they say, Ma Hada Rajulul Ladi Bu'itha Fikum. Fayaqulu Huwa Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They say, Who is this man who was sent among you? And he says, he is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then they say to him, wa ma ilmuk? Yaqulu qara'tu kitab Allahi fa'amantu bihi wa sadaqtu. They say, what was your knowledge? Some of the scholars say this means, what, what did you do? He's, and he, he replies back, that I read the book of Allah and I believed in it. And then, this, this, is, the, this is the trial over of the believer in the grave. There's also a hadith of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, which is also narrated by Imam Ahmad, and is also Sahih according to Shaykh al-Bani, which says that when a man is buried, and his friends leave him, an angel with a sledgehammer in his hand comes and sits by him, and asks him, what do you say about this man? If he is a believer, he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad al-abduhu wa rasooluhu, and then he says, Sadaqta, you have said the truth. Uh, the person, the believer says, I bear witness that there is none uh, worthy of worship of Allah and that Muhammad is his slave messenger. And that angel who's come with this sledgehammer, which I, I think even the word sledgehammer doesn't really do justice to what that hammer will be like, as you'll hear in a bit. This angel will come and sit and ask next to your head with the threat of this hammer hanging over you. What, what do you say about Prophet and the questions of the grave? So at the end of the hadith, some of the Sahaba, they said to the Prophet O oh, Messenger of Allah, there is no one amongst us, if he had an angel standing by him holding a hammer, he would be dumbfounded. He wouldn't be able to answer. You can imagine the fear of the situation. You just died. You are now waking up inside the grave in a dark, abandoned place. And you can hear the footsteps of the people going away from you. And you are alone and stuck there on your own. And the next thing you see is a stern angel coming to you with a hammer who comes next to you to question you. So you can imagine why this would cause someone to be extremely frightened to the state where he wouldn't even be able to speak. So the Sahaba asked the Prophet that if this happened to us, what, how could we be any, how would we be able to reply? So the Prophet وسلم, he replied, Yusabdikullahu ladina aru bin qawli thabit. That Allah will keep firm those who believe with the word that stands firm, which is also mentioned by Allah in the Quran, Surah Ibrahim. As for the disbeliever, the trial in the grave for the disbeliever. Going back to the hadith from Sayyid Bukhari from Anas the Prophet said, but as for the kafir or the munafiq, as for the disbeliever or the hypocrite, then he will say when he's asked the question, La Adri, Kuntu Akulu Ma Yakulun Nas. I don't know. I used to just say what the people used to say. And then it will be said to him, La Dareta Wala Kareta. 
that you didn't know and neither did you learn, neither did you study, neither did you read. So this is in the hadith of Bukhari from Anas So this, some of the scholars have bought evidence from this hadith and other hadith which bring similar wordings that one of the things that is required to be successful and to answer successfully in the grave is that you are not a blind follower. You are not somebody that just says, I said what the people just said. You have to be somebody who knows, as the angel will reply to him, La Dareta wa la tareta. You didn't know and neither did you read to find out. So we can't find out by blindly following people in these issues of Iman. We have to know, we have to know our Iman. We have to study our deen. We have to seek knowledge of our deen so that we can answer these questions that are going to be asked of us in the grave. So the disbeliever and the munafik, this, this will be some of the replies of some of them that I don't know when he's asked this question. I, I just used to say what the people used to say. The hadith of Barah bin Azim tells us more detail. In there, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said that then the, the evildoer's soul is returned to his body. And there come to him two angels who make him sit up and they say to him, Who is your Lord? So this interrogation happens. They say, Who is your Lord? And the person, the Prophet وسلم, told us what he says, he's going to say, Ha ha la adri. The oh, oh, I don't know. Then they will say to him, what is your religion? And again he will say, ha, ha, la adri. Oh, oh, I don't know. Then again they will ask him, who is this man who was sent among you? And again their reply is going to be, ha, ha, la adri. Oh, oh, I don't know. This will be the test and the trial of the disbeliever and his response and his result of that trial. Abu Sayyid al-Qudri, his hadith, which we mentioned before as well, it mentions from there that the Prophet ﷺ said, but if the person is a kafir or a munafiq, a disbeliever or a hypocrite, the angel will say to him, what do you say about this man? And then he will say, لا أدري الناس يقولون شيئاً. I don't know, I heard the people saying something. This will be the reply of the munafiq and the kafir. And then the angel will say to him, يقول لا دريت ولا تريت ولا احتديت. You did not know, you did not learn, and you were not guided. So these, this is the state and answer that will be given by the disbeliever in the trials of the grave. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us successful in the trial in the grave and keep us firm and give us the means to use our life to make us pass this awful trial that will happen in the grave. So then, what will be then the outcome? So, we've had the journey of the soul when it's taken out of the body, it's taken up by the angels up to the heavens and the two different things happen to it. Either it's admitted to heaven and it travels through up to the sun of heaven where it's greeted in a good way by those close to Allah and then Allah right, has its name written down in the Indian and then has it taken back to the grave with honor and with dignity and with goodness. Or this soul, the evil soul is taken wrapped in a disgusting smell, wrapped in an evil cloth, taken up to the heavens without any angel passing by, basically calling it a khabith soul, and being called evil names all the way to the heaven, and then not being allowed entry, and being thrown down from there all the way down until it lands in his grave. And then the next stage is of the trial of the grave, where the angels will come, the angels will ask questions and they will be doing so in a threatening manner. They will come with a huge hammer and sit next to you and ask you questions. So then there will be outcomes for the people. So firstly the outcome for the pious person in his grave. So then this person will have many blessings. From those blessings is that the grave will be furnished for, from paradise for him. He will be clothed in garments which will be from paradise. A gate to paradise will be opened for him and the breezes from paradise will come to him 
and he will smell the fragrance of paradise and he will delight in seeing the blessings of paradise. Also his grave will be made wide and spacious. And then he will be given glad tidings of Allah's pleasure and paradise and he will start to long for the hour to begin. He will start to long for the day of judgment to begin soon. And this is mentioned, all of these are mentioned in the hadith of Barah bin Azim, which we mentioned parts of before. That when that believer passes the test, when he answers the right questions, فَيُنَادِ مُنَادِ فِي السَّمَاءِ أَمْ صَدَقَ عَبْدِي فَأَفْرِشُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَأَلْبِسُوهُ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَافْتَقُوا لَهُ بَابًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Then a voice will call out from the heaven, My slave has spoken the truth. So prepare him a bed from paradise and give him clothes from paradise and open for him a door to paradise. Then there comes to him some of its fragrance and his grave is made wide as far as he can see. Then the Prophet mentioned something else that will happen after the pious person passes this test. He said, وَيَأْتِيهِ رَجُلٌ حَسَنُ الْوَجْهِ حَسَنُ الثِّيَابِ طَيِّبُ الرِّيْهِ فَيَقُولُ أَبْشِرْ بِالَّذِي يَصِرُّكَ حَالَ يَوْمُكَ الَّذِي كُنْتَ تُوْعَدْ Then there comes to him a man with a handsome face and handsome clothes and a beautiful fragrance. And the man says to him, Receive glad tidings that will bring you joy this day. And then he will say to him, قُولُ لَهُ مَنْ أَنْتَ وَجْهُكَ الْوَجْهُ يَجِيءُ بِالْخَيْرِ He will say to him, Who are you? Your face is a face which brings glad tidings. By looking at his face, you will know that this person is bringing goodness to him. Then this person will say, Ana amula ta sari, that I am your righteous good deeds. I am the good deeds that you used to do. Then that person, Fayakulu, Rabbi Akimis Sa'a, Hatta Abjia ila Ahli wa Mali. Oh Lord, hasten the hour, make it come quickly, so that I may go to my family and to my wealth. So this will be some of the outcomes of the person, the pious person. Also, from the other hadith, the person will be happy when he sees what would, would have been his place in hell and which Allah has replaced for him with a place in paradise. In Sahih al-Bukhari, in the hadith of Anas, that it will be said to the man, look at your place in hell for which Allah has replaced for you with a place in paradise. The Prophet said, and he will see them both. So this is Sahih Bukhari. So the person will be shown his place that he would have been in hell and he will be said to be now in paradise. So he will imagine the state that you can see that. That you can see that if I had done and failed this test, I would have been in this horrible place. But because of this, I am actually now in this point of going to this magnificent, beautiful place. It will increase the happiness of the person even more. There's one happiness which you'll get just from seeing what you're going to receive the reward. But when you also see what you've been saved from, that will be an even greater reward as well. Also, this is mentioned in the hadith of Abu Sayyid al-Khudri as well, that then a door to hell is open for him, and it is said to him, this is a pious person, a door to hell is open for him, and it is said to him, this would have been your place if you had disbelieved in your Lord, but because you believe, this is your place. Then a door to paradise will be open for him and he will want to go there but the angel will say to him, calm down. And then his grave will be made wide and spacious for him. So this again is, is such a great blessing that will be given to the pious in their graves. Then another thing that will be given is that he will sleep the sleep of a bridegroom. Like a person sleeps in happiness and excitement when he has, is newly married on his wedding day, he will also be sleeping with this sleep of happiness and excitement. The scholars explain the reason for this, which is mentioned in the hadith as well, because a bridegroom knows that in the morning he will be waking up with his love, with his beloved. So likewise, a person will go to sleep in his grave when he's promised Jannah, knowing that when he wakes up, he will be receiving the blessings of Jannah. So that happy sleep, just like you know, you, if you're going to do something uh, like when your children, you're going to go somewhere exciting the next day, you sleep happy. You know tomorrow will, to, the children are happy on the day of Eid, tomorrow morning is Eid, so they sleep happy on that night. So likewise, you will be sleeping happily in your grave, inshallah, waiting for paradise. 
So this is mentioned in the hadith of Abu Huraira that his grave will be expanded 70 cubits wide. So a cubit is the space from your fingertip to your elbow. This is one cubit. So this is more than a foot. So 70 cubits wide space the grave will open up into a huge open space and it will be filled with light. And then he will say, let me go back to my family and tell them. But he wants to go back and tell his family about the goodness that he's receiving. But it will be said to him, sleep like a bridegroom who no one will wake but his most beloved. And he will sleep like that until Allah raises him up. So these are just about eight um, issues that I mentioned, blessings that will be in the graves of the pious people. And we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us all from those people and that he grants us these blessings in the grave. So then we come on to the issue of the graves of the evil doers, the evil people. The graves and the torment that they will receive in the graves will vary according to the sins that the evil people committed by when they were in the world. Whether the person was a kafir or whether he was an evil or sinful Muslim. Sinful Muslims will also have the threat of the punishment of the grave as well. This is a chance for Muslims to go into this as well. So none of us should think that we are safe of this. There are many Sahih Hadith which describe this torment and these are some of the things that are described. One of the things is that the person will be struck with a huge iron sledgehammer. In the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari from Anas which mentioned that this angel will come and sit by your head with this sledgehammer. He said, then he will be struck with a blow with an iron hammer between his ears and he will scream a scream which everything around him will hear except for the mankind and the jinn. So this is in Sahih Bukhari for Allah. Also, furnishings from hell will be prepared for him. He will be clothed with fire. He will be given clothes of fire. A door of hell will be opened for him and his grave will become constricted and narrow for him. And he will be struck with another great hammer. There's another hammer which is mentioned. Which is such a hammer that if it was to strike a mountain, the mountain would turn into dust. And then he will be given the tidings of torment in the hereafter and he will wish that the hour of their judgment never comes. And this is mentioned in the hadith of al barab bin Azib that a voice will call from the heaven and it will say, if he has lied when he is given his answer, prepare for him a bed from hell and clothe him from hell and open for him a gate to hell. Then the heat and the hot winds of hell will come to him. And the grave will be constricted and will compress him up until his ribs interlock with each other. Then a man will come to him with an ugly face and ugly clothes and a foul stench and will say to him, receive the bad news. This is the day that you were promised. And he will say back to him, who are you? Your face is a face which brings evil. He will say, I am your evil deeds. Then he will say, oh Lord, do not let the hour come, do not let the hour come. So despite the fact that this person will be going through such torment, when he realizes that this means what comes next is even worse than this, he will still beg Allah that don't let what's coming next come either. One of the other things in, that will happen to some people in the grave, from the torments of the grave, is that some of them will be swallowed by the earth. There's a hadith of Ibn Umar, which is narrated in both Bukhari and Muslim that the Prophet said whilst a man was going and dragging his lower garment out of pride the earth swallowed him up and he will continue sinking into the earth until the day of judgment so this is Bukhari and Muslim and it also shows us the importance of the issue of keeping your lower garment above your ankles other things that will happen is that the edge of the mouth will be torn with an iron hook placed into the mouth from behind and torn to the back of the head. The head of someone will be smashed with a rock until it cracks and open. 
Some people will be burned in an oven, a tanur oven, which, which is usually used for cooking. And some people will be forced to swim and in a river of blood. And while they're swimming in the river of blood, they will be pelted with stones. And all of these things are mentioned in the hadith of Samur bin Jundub, which is in Sahih Bukhari, which is a long hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam often used to ask his companions in this hadith that has any of you had a dream? Then those whom Allah willed would tell him about their dreams. One morning he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself said, last night two people came to me, meaning in a dream. And they woke me up and they said, let's go. So I set out with them. And we came across a man who was lying down with another man standing over him holding a huge rock. He threw the rock down on the man's head, smashing his head. The rock rolled away. The one who had thrown the rock followed it and picked it up and came back. By the time he came back, the head of that man had been restored again. So first it was smashed and by the time this angel goes and picks this rock up again, the head comes back to its normal state again. He then, then the one who threw the rock did the same as before and it carries on happening. So he said, I said to my two companions, SubhanAllah, who are these two people? They said, move on. So we went on and we came to a man who was lying flat on his back with another man standing over him holding an iron hook. He put the hook in the man's mouth and he tore off that side of his face from his, from, uh, to the back of his neck. And he then put it in his nose, the hook into the nose, and he tore his face from his nose to the back of his head. And then he put the hook in his eye, and he tore his eye right to the back of his head. Then he turned to the other side of his face, and he did the same. He put the hook in, he tore his face, from the front to the back of his head. Then he tore his nostril to the back of his head. Then he tore from his eye socket out to the back of his head. No sooner had he finished doing that to the second side, but the first side was restored again, back to its normal state. Then he went back to that first side and started doing it again. So this is happening again and again. The person is getting his face torn, in three times in this evil manner and the, the, it happens to the other side of his face while it's happening to that side this side returns to normal and the key should, keeps on repeating and keeps on repeating so he, the Prophet ﷺ said I said again to my two companions SubhanAllah who are these two persons they said move on so we went on and we came to something like a tanur an oven at that time which is usually lined with clay, clay and is extremely hot and is used to bake bread. And he said, the Prophet said, um, that in the oven there were much noises and there were many voices he could hear coming from the oven. So the Prophet said, we looked into the oven. So this oven, these ovens are like, the top is narrow, that has a hole in the top. And then it widens out and it's wide underneath. So they looked into this oven and he said, we saw inside naked men and naked women. A flame of fire was reaching them from the bottom of the oven. And when it reached them, they cried out loudly and screamed out. So then I asked them, who are these? And they said to me, move on. So we went on and we came to a river. And the, uh, the Sahabi, Samur uh, Jundub, he says, I think, he said that this river was red like blood. He said, in the river there was a man who was trying to swim. And on the bank there was another man who had gathered many stones. So whilst this swimmer was trying to swim to the bank, the man who had gathered the stones approached him. The swimmer opened his mouth and the man on the bank threw a stone into the mouth. And the swimmer then got pushed back and carried on swimming again. And every time he came back, he opened his mouth and the man on the back threw another stone in his mouth. He was pushed back again and this carried up and happened again. So I said to my two companions, who are these two persons? They said, move on, move on. So at the end of the hadith, the Prophet said, I said to them, I have seen many wonders this night. What do all of these things mean that I have seen? They said, we will tell you. 
the first man you came across whose head was being smashed with a rock is the man who studies the Quran and neither recites it nor acts upon it and he goes to sleep neglecting the obligatory prayers. The man you came across whose mouth, nose and ears were being torn from the front to the back is the man who goes out of his house in the morning and he tells a lie that is so serious that it spreads all over the world. The naked men and women that you saw in a structure that resembled an oven are the adulterers and the adulteresses. The man who you saw swimming in the river with rocks being thrown in his face was the one who consumed riba, interest and usury. So in the commentary of this hadith, al Hafiz ibn Hajar said, this indicates that some sinners will be punished in al barza which is barza as we said, begins at the point at which you die and ends to the point of the beginning of the day of judgment when you are raised. Another thing, we are on to the twelfth thing that will be happening to evil people in their graves is that anything that they've stolen from the war booty, they've taken unjustly from the war booty, it will be set on fire and placed upon them. Bukhari and Muslim rate from Abu Hurairah that we went out with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Khaybar and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us victory. We did not take gold or silver as booty, rather we seized goods and food and clothes. And then we set out for the valley. Along with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a slave whose name was Rifa'at Rifa ibn Zayd. When we camped in the valley, the slave of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stood up and began to unpack his saddlebag when he was struck by a stray arrow, which proved fatal and he died. We, we said congratulations to him, for he is a martyr, O Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to us, No, not so, by the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He stole a small garment from the booty on the day of Khaybar. And this, it was not part of his share of the war booty. That is burning him, burning on him like fire. The people then became very distressed by this. And it got to the stage where a man brought one or two shoelaces and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I found these on the day of Khaybar. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, a lace of fire or two shoelaces of fire. Number 13, along with the physical punishments, there will be a spiritual and mental torture which is that in the grave, the kafir and the munafiq and the evildoer will be shown what would have been his place in paradise and if he had obeyed his Lord. And this will increase his regret, this will increase his pain when he realizes the greatness of the blessing that he has left and missed out on. In the Hadith of Sayyid al-Qudri, which we mentioned before, the Prophet said that then a door to paradise is open for him and he says, this, the angel says to him, this would have been your position if only you had believed in your Lord. But because you disbelieved, Allah has replaced it for you with this. Then a gate to hellfire will be opened for him and then he will be struck with a blow with a hammer which is heard by all of Allah's creation apart from the two races, meaning mankind and jinn. So these are just some of the kinds of punishments that will be befalling some sinners in the grave. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us refuge from the torment of the grave and to keep us safe from these evil punishments of the grave. Mm -hmm. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentioned in his Kitab al-Ruh something very beautiful about the reasons for the punishment in the grave. And this is very important for us to know this evil so that we can keep ourselves safe from this. He said that some people may wonder about the reasons for which people are punished in their graves. He said this may be answered in two ways, general, a general answer and a detailed answer. He said in, in a general uh, answer, they may be punished for their ignorance of Allah, for their ignoring His commands and their disobedience towards Him. Allah does not punish any soul that acknowledged Him and loved Him and obeyed His command and heeded His prohibitions, nor does He punish the body of that person which was inhabited by such a soul. 
punishment in the grave and in the hereafter are due to the wrath and the anger of Allah towards his slave. Whoever angers Allah in this world and does not repent and dies like that, he will be punished in al-barzakh to the level commensurate with Allah's anger with him. Then he said, as for the detailed answer, the Prophet ﷺ told us about two men who he saw being punished in their graves. One of them used to walk around spreading malicious gossip among the people. And the other one used to fail to take precautions to avoid getting urine on himself. So the latter failed to purify himself as required, and the former did something that creates enmity among the people by talking even if what he says is true. Thus it may be noted that the one who stirs up enmity by telling lies and making false statements will be punished even more. Then he said failing to keep oneself clean from urine indicates that the one who neglects, indicates that this person neglects prayer as well. For cleansing urine, cleansing oneself from urine is a requirement and condition and because of this the person will be punished even more. Then it says, according to the hadith of Shu'bah, it says one of them used to eat the flesh of the people, which means that he used to backbite uh, the people. And according to the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud, a man was struck with a whip and his grave was filled with fire because he offered a single prayer without having tahara, without having purified himself. And he passed by one who was wronged and did not help him. He passed by someone who was being wrong, he had the ability to help that person and he left him to be wrong. According to the hadith of Samura bin Jundab in Sahih al-Bukhari which we went through, a person who told a lie that spread far and wide was punished, a person who read Quran that slept at night and did not act upon it by day was punished, was punished. adulterers and adulteresses are punished, the one who consumes riba is punished. According to the hadith of Abu Hurairah some people's heads will be crushed by rocks. The reason their heads will be crushed by rocks is that their heads were too heavy for them to get up and pray. So because these people were finding their head too heavy to get up off the pillow and pray, the punishment that they will be receiving in their grave will be that their head will be smashed and crushed by rocks. He said some people will be grazing on horrid types of food from hell. The reason will be that they withheld zakat from their wealth. Some people will be forced to eat putrid, rotten meat because they committed zina. Some people will be having their lips and their tongues cut off with iron scissors because of fitna being caused by their words and their speech. According to the hadith of Sayyid al-Khudri, those who committed these crimes will be punished. Some of them will have on, uh, in the grave as a punishment, they will have bellies as big as houses and they will, that will be because they used to consume a river. Some of them will open their mouths and have stones thrown into their mouths. The stones will go straight through their body and come out through their backside. The reason for that will be because they used to unjustly consume the wealth of the orphans. Some of the people will be hung up by their breasts and the reason for that will be that they committed zina. Some of them will have their sides cut and they will be forced to eat the flesh from their own sides. They are the ones who used to engage in backbiting. Some of them will be given nails made out of copper and they will scratch their own faces and their own chests off. And they are the ones who used to go around attacking people's honor. The Prophet ﷺ also told us that one who stole a cloak from the war booty will be wrapped in a cloak of fire in his grave. This is despite the fact that he was entitled to share of the war beauty. So how about those who wrong others unlawfully? He said the punishment of the grave is for the sins of the heart, the sins of the eye, the sins of the ear, the sins of the mouth, the tongue, the stomach, the private parts, the hand, the foot and the entire body. Those who spread malicious gossip, tell lies, backbite, give false witness, slander those who are chaste and innocent, spread fitna, fitna, promote bid'a, say things about Allah and His Messenger without knowledge and speak in a reckless manner. Those who consume riba, who consume orphans' wealth and who consume haram wealth such as bribery and the like. And those who consume the wealth of their Muslim brothers unlawfully, 
or the wealth of non-Muslims unlawfully, or consume intoxicants, and adulterers and people who are sexually deviated, thieves and traitors and betrayers and plotters, those who consume riba, those who pay riba, those who record riba, and those who witness riba, those who people who enter into a marriage only to divorce the woman later so that she becomes permissible for her former husband and for the former husband for whom this is done. And this is something actually that Muslims nowadays do as a religious act. They call it halala. You find, especially in the Indian and Pakistani blind following community of the innovators, you find that they've instituted this thing called halala, where if a man, they, they made up this condition that if a man gives three divorces in one sitting to a woman, that she can no longer be married to him unless she marries someone else. Then these people end up in anger, saying divorce three times. Then they go to their Mulan Asar and they ask him what should be done. He will then tell them that what needs to be done is halala. And that, what that means is that the woman is brought, she's basically emotionally forced to come. She is married in this ceremony to someone, usually the man who actually gave the fatwa. He takes her away, he commits the act with her, then he brings her back and then he divorces her and lets remarries her to her husband. So this is disgusting habit that is very rife in the Indian subcontinent amongst the people of Bidah who attack people of uh, Sunnah and Hadith. This is one of the reasons for the punishment of the grave. This, they call it halala and it is completely haram. There's nothing halal about it. And Allah's Messenger وسلم, cursed such people. Ibn al qayyim also mentioned those people who seek to harm the Muslims and who seek to expose their errors and faults, they will also be facing punishment on the day, uh, in their graves. Those who rule by something other than that which Allah has revealed. Those who issue rulings based on things that Allah has not prescribed. And those who help others in committing sins and transgressions. Those who kill souls whom Allah has forbidden us to kill. Those who deny the names and attributes of Allah those who give their opinions and ideas precedence over the sunnah of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those who wail for the dead and those who listen to them wailing. Those who will wail in hell are those who sing songs that are forbidden by Allah's Messenger and those people who listen to such songs. Those who build mosques over the graves and set up lamps in them and those who try to make, take more when, they, uh, when they're taking something than they are owed and try to give less when they give what they owe. The tyrants, the arrogant, those who show off, the slanderers and the backbiters, and those who slander the Salaf, those who go to soothsayers, astrologers, fortune tellers, those who help wrongdoers, those who have sold their hereafter for the sake of others in this world. Those who if you remind them to fear Allah, they do not pay heed. But if you try to scare them by mentioning another person, they pay heed and they refrain from what they're doing. Those who when they are told words of Allah and His Messenger, they don't pay attention. But if they hear it from someone they like, then who may be right or wrong, they follow it and do not go against it. Those to whom the Quran is recited, but they are not affected by it. And it may be burdens, burdensome for them when they hear the Quran. And those who when they hear the Quran of Shaitan, what he means here is music, that which calls to zina, and that which calls to hypocrisy, they feel good and it cheers them up, and they wish that the singer would not stop. And those who swear by Allah and tell lies, but when they swear by their sheikh or their relatives, or of the life of one whom they love and respect, they don't lie, even if they are threatened and tortured. Those who boast of their sins in front of their brothers, those from whom you do not feel your possessions and dignity are safe, those who engage in obscene speech, whom people shun for fear of their evil, those who delay their prayer until the end of its time and then quickly pack out the prayer, remembering Allah only a little. Those who do not pay the zakat of their wealth willingly. Those who do not perform hajj when they are able to. And do not do the requires, uh, required duties even when they are able to. Those who are not cautious with regard to what they look at or what they say or eat or where they go. And do not care whether the wealth that they acquire is halal or haram. 
those people who do not uphold the ties of kinship or show compassion towards the poor or to the widows, to the orphans or to animals. Rather, they forsake orphans and do, they do not urge others to feed the poor. They show off to people, they withhold small kindnesses and they seek out people's faults and sins and ignore their own. All of these and their likes will be punished in their grave for these sins according to how great or small they were. Because most people are like this, most of the inhabitants of the grave will be punished. And those who succeed will be very few. The outside of the grave is just earth, but inside it is regret and torment. The outside may be soil and carved stones, whilst inside it is disaster and calamity, boiling with grief and sorrow like a kettle, and no wonder when they no longer get what they want of their desires and their wishes. The, there are lessons in this world which need no further exhortation. It calls out, O dwellers of the earth, you have focused on building a realm that will soon pass away, and you have neglected the realm to which you are quickly moving. You have built houses in which others are going to live instead of you, and in, they will enjoy them instead of you, but you have neglected the houses for which there are no other inhabitants but you. This is the place where you will abide and bid where, farewell to work and toil. This is what matters, one of the gardens of paradise or one of the chambers of hell. So these are some of the things that are the causes of the punishment in the hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us and to grant us safety from these uh, deeds that cause this evil punishment of the hellfire. I'm going to end there, inshallah.